you know, you call art whatever you want. I think of art as just a painting or something, but there's so many forms of art, you know. Seeing a vision and putting it together, that's pretty impressive. My name is Tim Williams. I build custom flintlock muzzle loaders, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about one in particular, one that was made for David Crockett um, back in the late 18th century. He was 18 years old when it was made, but before I go too much into that story, which is a story in itself, I'm going to talk a little bit about flintlocks. Um, of course, the first thing is the ignition which is different than most guns that you would see as far as modern guns. What happens here is I would put powder in the pan, close the frizzing, and then as I spark that, that makes a spark which ignites the powder in the pan, which sets it off. So quickly to go through the whole process, I would have a powder measure and a powder horn. I would load and put the charge down the barrel. Then I would put a patched round ball in and push it down with a ramrod and seat it firmly down all the way to the bottom. Then I would turn it back up, cock the hammer, put the powder in the pan, close it, and then when I go to shoot, and then the spark would set the powder pan off. So that's basically a simple way that the, the flintlock works. Very effective, very efficient and it works very well, actually. So what I'm gonna talk about now a little bit is actually this particular rifle, which is patterned after the original rifle that Davy Crockett had when he was probably 18 years old. He, um, I actually was fortunate enough to handle the original. It's in the East Tennessee Museum in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Was gracious enough to allow me the opportunity to handle it and to measure it and so forth like that. So with that being said, I feel accurate in my reproduction of this gun, as close as I could make it to the original. The patch box is made just like it was in the 18th century from sheet brass. Sometimes they cast the, the lids, but this one in particular was sheet brass. The opener is right here. It opens up and then opens up into a, a hand cut cavity. The hinge is made the same way. You just roll the metal around, the different things like that. Then you cut out the hinges the actual knuckles themselves for that. Then everything's fastened the same. The engraving's done with a hand engraver, just like they would have used in the 18th century. Nice piece of curly maple wood was the, the foundation for it all. Hard stock, which was a very durable stock. You have brass on the, the butt plate, a brass trigger guard, and then a silver thumb piece. Now, a lot of times the silver thumb pieces were engraved with uh, sometimes the owners initials, sometimes the maker would sign it with his initials there. This one in particular had nothing, which is what most ended up with. Whether it was just a gun that was made, maybe not particularly for somebody, and they never got it back to the maker to, to where he could uh, engrave it. I'm not sure about that, but a lot of originals do not have anything on the thumb piece. Some have just decorations, some have the initials and so forth. When you move down through, you've got a lock that's that's this one in particular is not handmade, but they were then. But this one is modified and hand-tuned by myself to where everything will work because the most important thing with a flint lock is lock time, is the quickness that the lock goes off, the smoothness. So those are the important features. Then as you can see, function is the most important thing with a rifle because your life depended on it, whether you're eating or defending yourself. But Nobody said function had to be ugly either, so a lot of times they were decorated well. This is a prime example of that with the York County, with the carving around here, which is very common for York County. The top piece here is very similar around the tang carving. It's very similar to what George Schroyer used, a little variation to that. Then when we come over to this side, you can see the carving on this side. York County style, but very unique in its own. No one knows the maker of this particular gun, but it was definitely a York County. You can tell by the architecture and the style of it. But this is the carving pattern that comes through, all hand cut and cut out with a, a knife and carving chisels and so forth. Side plate also made out of a piece of sheet brass. This one in particular has double set triggers. The thing with a double set trigger is you set the rear trigger and what that does is make the front trigger very much like a hair trigger. This rifle also has wedge keys, which is an easier way that you can push that out. That retains the barrel. 
There's a tenon inside that holds the wedge key goes through and that keeps the barrel attached to the stock. And there's not much stock here. When you take the wood out of a, a firearm like this, it's a little bit of a scary proposition because it's very thin. The only purpose really of this wood was to hold the thimbles. I mean, that was basically it. So it's very thin. You work your way down through here. The thimbles are handmade just like they were in the 18th century. Once again, out of sheet brass. They come around, a little bit of engraving here, facet it out, they start their life round, and then they, you shape them to the, the octagon shape. You work your way down to the nose cap and the same thing. You shape the entire stock, then the nose cap forms to the shape of the stock and you inlet it. Very much the same way that they would have done it in the 18th century. Everybody had their own technique, their own trick. This one in particular has a, a horn tip ramrod on it. That was a very common feature, more common in Europe, I think, than here. The main reason that I do it now is because it's impervious to everything, it seems like. It doesn't tear, it doesn't fray, it doesn't damage from, from years and years of use. So uh, I put the, the horn tip on there. This barrel in particular is a 44-inch swamp barrel. The swamp barrel was very common in the 18th century as well as now. What it does, it starts out heavy at the breech, and then it thins its way down through the waist and it gets very thin through here. And then it flares back out a little bit at the muzzle. And what that does is puts the balance point right where your hand will be holding it. So you've got a 44 inch rifle right here that balances right where your hand is gonna be. And that is the perfect thing. This one is rifled. This one in particular has a one in 66 twist, which rifling was very common in the 18th century as well. So. I'm going to be a little more specific now and talk about certain things on this rifle. One in particular is the patch box. The design, like I said earlier, is a York County style out of Pennsylvania. This little rooster finial here is very unique to this gun. Only one other really example is very similar to this was done by George Schroyer. Uh, the side panels were different on that one, but the, this finial was very similar. But once again, as you look through this, a rooster head, some people call it different things. So, but it was a bit of a challenge coming up through with that. Making everything here out of the brass is, is always somewhat of a challenge as far as with the hinges and so forth, because what you have is you have a curved stock that curves like this, but for a hinge to work, this part has to be relatively flat. So you have to almost have the deception that this whole thing curves, but the top does flatten more than, than what you think. That's a challenge in itself, then the engraving pattern is a little different, a little unique on this one. The releases were in different places, depending on the maker, the different schools, the different counties and so forth. It gets confusing at times, but there are a lot of similarities that help define which area that the rifle came from, like this one in particular from Crockett, it was not a signed rifle, but everyone does agree that it was came from the, the York County area. Sometimes these uh, releases like this would be di disguised more as a screw. Um, actually, <laughs> Simon Locke and the Sheets brothers down in, in um, Virginia sometimes, one was you push this hinge and the hinge actually released it so you couldn't find it. You know, So there's a lot of things, I think some of the makers tried to disguise the release so that nobody could find it almost. All of the mechanisms in here, there's a catch that bends around. This catch, everything are handmade in the shop just like they were in the 18th century and spring loaded. What we're gonna talk about here is the relief carving that we have in different areas. Here at first glance, it doesn't look like much, but if you can look closer and see the depth and the detail that goes into the carving, which was very common also in, in York County. This pattern, very similar to it, but there's just a lot of stuff. At first glance, it looks simple, but the more you look, the different petals, the relief, the way everything comes together is much more detailed. And that's what separates uh, carving from plain carving to a more detailed, is it has depth, very similar to like to say, the engraving on the metal you have the depth to it. Here you relieve wood and you can show a little more of that. So as you see, every pattern's a little different. They're not always exactly the same, but the way you model and the way you shape the different parts of the carving is what brings it together to it. So those are some of the, probably the most challenging parts on this. As you can see also, this is a very good piece of curly maple with a lot of curl. 
that presents many challenges in its, of its own when you're carving. You'll start to carve a certain way and relieve it, then you have to stop and come back the other way. The grain changes constantly. So you have to go at it slow, easy, and that's where the hand tools, you don't lose anything. A good sharp hand chisel can relieve wood pretty quickly. So the, as pretty as the, the curl is to look at, it's just as difficult to work with. But I think when it's all finished, the end result gives a very nice and appealing look to it. Plus, once again, with the curly maple, it's very strong and durable.